In this video, I want to analyze the Paracas skulls. I want to analyze Brian Forster's idea of them having a Black Sea origin, as well as going over the DNA results, and what I'd ultimately like to figure out is, what does this mean? What could they be? And what does this say about humanity? Now, if you don't know, the Paracas skulls were initially rift with legend. People thought they could be some semblance of ancient alien-human hybridization. Some people thought it could be a new species. Most people thought it was just a hoax. Now, what you're seeing is Google Earth. Very simple, right? But I drew a couple connections, most of which, all of which, really, are not necessarily my own work. If you want to see where all of this is actually coming from, please check out the link in the description below uh, for Brian Forster's YouTube channel. He's an actual PhD on the field in Peru doing the real work. Um, and so ultimately, I can bring all the conjecture I want from my knowledge of history and his findings, but they are his findings and he's the expert. But we have this right here, Paracas, roughly speaking. That's where these skulls are found. Skulls like this one right here, as well as this one over here. Now, what you need to keep in mind is that both of these skulls exhibit, as you can see, cranial deformation, okay? Or an elongated skull, let's say. Um, this one in particular seems to be a product of cranial deformation, whereas this one over here, and you can see a fundamental difference in how they look, okay, from the back. Fundamental morphological difference in how they are shaped. This one to the left seems to be a product of natural birth in that it came out like this. No human altered how this skull was shaped like it did with the wider one over here. This one seems to be natural. Now skulls like this one have been DNA tested. DNA shows, back to my Google Earth, that they actually come all the way from here, right by the Black Sea. Interestingly enough, there are a lot of elongated skulls from this general area. Many legends as well, and we'll go over some of them as well, of red-headed tall humans. Um, and in many cases, this could have been these Paracas people. Now, the Paracas skulls, at the most, from what I've seen, have been dated at around 2,800 years ago. Now, the white skull that seems to be a product of cranial deformation is, again, dated at 2,000 years. Brian Forster's idea is that what we could see is a slow drip of the DNA of one species being filtered out over time, and then as that time went on, in order to maintain power, they elongated their skulls in a vain attempt to mimic their ancestors and maintain their spot as royalty. But it seems the gene pool was too diluted. So it's important to keep in mind, I'm not showing you conjecture right now. These are real skulls, both from the same place, about five to 800 years apart. The one on the right was DNA tested to have um, red hair. Some of them have blonde hair. They all have hair texture that we only see in Caucasians, which is wispy and long and a lot of it. And not only that, but their DNA haplogroup, and a haplogroup is a piece of DNA, uh, a group of individuals who all share the same DNA rather from certain locations. And so we can pinpoint where people come from as a result of it. Their haplogroups are almost exclusively found in Europeans, but specifically people from the Black Sea and Caspian Sea area. So people from here have been found who actually come from all the way across the world right there. Okay, where interestingly enough elongated skulls have also been found. So what does this mean? The first place I want to look at is this one right here. Uh, I believe it's pronounced Piatigorsk. Of course, I have no clue how to say that. Uh, but elongated skulls were found and why is that important? Let's take a look at the skulls. These are examples of the skulls found. The first thing you might notice is that they actually share a lot of the same morphological traits as the Paracas skulls. It's hard to find something as good as this 3D representation of the Paracas skulls for all of the elongated skulls, but I think if we take a look at this one specifically right here, the one that is most obviously not just a human that had their skull cranially deformed at birth, and we compare it to the ones found in, uh, let's just say, the Black Sea Caspian area, we're going to see a lot of similarities. First and foremost, take a look at this big part on the front. It seems to be that one of the major differences is that right here on the top part of the skull, you get a giant crest, a bump, and then it seems to peter out a bit, and supposedly what we're seeing towards the back is a part where the skull dips, 
Um, and, and this is postured to have been as a direct result of a, a separation of the brain hemispheres and the skull sort of forming itself around that. Obviously, this is something you do not see in human skulls at all. Now, in these pictures, we can't see the back. That's a big problem. But we can see the front. Let's see if the skulls found in the Black Sea area also seem to have this general bump on the front. Something that if you just move over to the left, people from the same area don't seem to have when they have a skull that is a direct result of cranial deformation. Okay, so what we're seeing right off the bat, right, first of all, on this one, I'm seeing what could be the beginnings of one of those crests right here, okay? Um, and on this one, you're seeing some cracks right here that almost certainly point you in the same direction, that there is some kind of bump right there. I'd like to see the back of them, but there's a couple of other similarities as well. One thing you'll notice about the morphology of the skull is that first and foremost, the nose is farther down. The jaw is not top heavy. It seems to be that uh, the top part of the jaw was rather small. In fact, the jaw seems to be very small overall the cheekbones seem to be quite pronounced and there seems to be a little bit more complexity to the part that connects the cheekbone area uh, the muscles of your jaw to the rest of the skull talking about this general area also coincidentally the part of the brain the part of your face that would have had your ears and you look over here okay this is a regular human skull from 2000 years ago i think you're going to notice a very big difference when we pan back to the other skull so if I go all the way around and I show you the other side, okay, you get a very, very clear uh, down here through the eye ridge. Here's the cheeks and it goes up towards the back, okay? Very, very patterned, right? We know what it's supposed to look like. Not just that, but there's a difference in the eyes. Major difference in the eyes. These eye sockets are pretty average for what you'd expect from a human. Now take a look at these. First and foremost, side by side, these are fundamentally larger. And you're seeing it mostly towards the bottom, right? The eyes seem to be held up more with the human skull, uh, a little bit more circular. You look over here, they don't have a lot of space between what would have been their cheeks and what would have been their eyes. I mean, everything is very packed in. Um, it also looks like their noses were quite large as well. And there seems to be a complete absence of a brow ridge, which is very interesting. But again, the eyes are fundamentally larger uh, in every way than we would see in a human. Now, skeptics who are from USA Today, there's this article, I'll put some uh, snippets of it on the screen link in the description below they tried to say that the skull on the right the one that we've been analyzing specifically and all the ones like it are just a product of cranial deformation and uh, an artificially elongated skull despite the fundamental differences but they also claim that the eyes are no different than what a human would have and are in perfect um, accurate variation for what a human could have on the higher end of the spectrum and, you know, admittedly, they were attacking the idea of this being an alien hybrid, which I don't think it is. I think that's too far. I think that's just wishful conjecture. It's like Bigfoot people who believe that Bigfoots are actually put on the planet with, you know, UFOs and aliens. It's like, okay, well, now you took a thousand steps forward. You haven't even proved that Bigfoot exists yet. Why, are, you know, how, how can you say aliens did it? So to me, I get it. I, I understand that. But their reasoning was wrong. And then you're going to get so many more conspiracy theorists out there because they're going to notice that your reasoning is faulty and they're going to think you're hiding something. Uh, so that's what I end up talking about now. Just because I cut out the part where I was originally going to talk about this, but then I referenced it. So I wanted to make that clear. What I find most fascinating about that article is it tries to say that these eyes are perfectly well within human variation. But that doesn't mean anything. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of how this stuff works. Humans can also be seven foot tall, but that doesn't mean humans are giants. The idea is that you should almost never find a skeleton of a human that is seven feet tall because it's so rare. The fact that we're finding so many skulls that share the same morphological traits says that this was not uncommon. This was a normal person, not somebody on a crazy side of the spectrum of human variation. That's the difference. Another important thing to keep in mind is the jaw. Something you can't notice is that they lack molars that we have. So they lack certain molars, right? They're making more room for other things. You can already tell right off the bat that the human skull has, I mean, the whole mouth area is just messed up. We've got a bunch of teeth in there. There's a lot of stuff going on in the human mouth, but over here it's much more clear and concise, much more defined jawline, right? Makes a lot of sense. Now back to the side profile. I showed you guys this little area over here. Take a look at this skull. We'll pan back to it, 
okay? Really get in close. Take a look at that. Does that look the same as that to you? We're seeing down right an L shape, okay? On this skull, that's not what you see. We're seeing it go down and right and then upwards, okay? There's also more complexity and there's more going on down here. Again, look at this one. You see it? It's very simple. There's not a lot going on. You have a little bit of a gap right there, but it's not to the same degree. It's very, very simple in the way that it's set up. Now, if we go back to this one, we're seeing something completely different. Completely different. Do you see it? Completely different, okay? Not to mention this little part of the jaw down here, this little part of the head in general. This is completely absent from the human version. Completely absent. All these extra bone protrusions, completely absent. Okay, it's actually fascinating. Now, another thing to keep in mind, I'm not exactly sure if these... Okay, it will. Look at where the hole is. This is where your spinal cord connects to your head. Okay, notice how it's at the very far back part of the skull. Now, when you go to a human's, that's not how we work. You'll notice right off the bat, there's no hole in the same spot. So this artist rendition is not showing it, but yours is going to be centered in the middle. And I'll put a picture up showing that. So we have a centered spinal cord connection to our head. These things did not. But you can see, if I can get right back in there, look at the hole right here. That's not where yours is. Yours would be right there in the middle. Theirs is right here in the back. That's a fundamental difference. That is absolutely massive. All right, so back to these. Are we seeing something similar? And I think we are. Uh, I think right off the bat, you're getting the square jaw. I think right off the bat, you're getting the big eyes. I think right off the bat, you're getting um, a look to their head that seems to match more of the confirmed whatever this is and less of the confirmed human skull. I mean, there's just a fundamental difference to how these two things look. It is not even remotely similar outside of the fact that it's both of something of a hominin species. But other than that, um, they are fundamentally different. You would never see these two skulls not knowing what they came from and think they were the same thing, right? And I think that's what we're seeing here too. In these skulls, specifically this one, that have been found right here on the cusp of the Black and Caspian Seas. So what is my theory based on limited evidence? Well, you'll notice I have multiple different spots marked right here. Um, I have elongated skulls that have been found in Arkham, which is a wood henge in Russia. Elongated skulls found on the Tobol River. Again, pictures are being shown of all of these as I say it. And elongated skulls found in a forest near Omsk in Russia. Now, interestingly enough, 12,000 years ago, they found an artificially deformed skull that was elongated in Manchuria, which is China, um, which is way off the beaten path. Now, my theory is that because this general area is most likely the location of pastoralist steppe nomads, the Huns, and they often practice this. Now, I'm putting up iconography as I speak about it. What I think happened is that because the Manchurians were well connected with the Mongolians, culturally speaking, who were well connected with pastoralist Eurasian steppe nomads, I think that uh, just the trend of elongating your skull was just passed down through the pastoralist steppe nomads, through the steppes of Eurasia. That's what I think happened. There are some people who think it could have come from an earlier culture in this general area from right before the last ice age, but I couldn't really find almost anything, actually, to uh, support that. It's just an idea. Okay, so the idea then would be that these people are native to this area of the world. This is where we find the skulls I just showed you. They are nearly contemporary with the skulls found in Paracas only within a few hundred years difference, okay? The implication, of course, being that they migrated out of this area and they went all the way over here and they tried to rebuild. Now, why? If you know anything about history, you know that this general area is a wonderful place to live, except that it's not because even though the resources are nice, the land is nice, and it's a very, very tempting place to want to build a civilization, if you decide to live here, you will be constantly battered, raped, pillaged, warred with, killed, and enslaved by pastoralist steppe nomads every single time. History, in fact, is almost entirely dictated by these migrations of people from this area. Whether they're making waves into Europe and becoming modern day Europeans, making waves into I Iran and attacking the Persians or invading North India. And we've now proven that that's the idea behind the Aryans. These are the original Indo-Europeans. And then they morphed over time as the Indo-Europeans conquered and settled into new lands. They were gradually replaced by steppe nomads from further east who then become the Mongolians. 
right? And then ethnically speaking, it seems to be almost exclusively uh, East Asian uh, with a little bit of Turkish is what we'll end up calling it. Um, and not as much Indo-European in that regard. Okay, so my theory is that these people were absolutely no different. That they were probably in a position of power um, in this general area. These blonde, red-headed, whatever they were. And that they probably were facing constant conflict with humans. Probably deserved it in, in the sense that they may have enslaved us. Many of the myths say that they ate us or that they were evil. Um, there's a lot of myths surrounding tall, red-headed, giant people, tall people. And I think that all of them are rooted in truth to some degree. But my theory is that because they were being driven to extinction, that they had one last-ditch effort. And they got on boats, and that's how they got to Paracas. You have to say to yourself, I'm technically right by default, right? Because we know, genetically speaking, that people from this area share haplogroups with people from this area, and they're contemporary and they have elongated skulls. Okay, so at this point, we're splitting hairs. We know they got here on a boat, because you didn't fly here, you didn't run here, because too much water, okay? So we, we know they got here on a boat. The question is how and, and possibly when. My theory, and Brian Forster's theory, is that they took a variety, they could have taken a variety of different currents and made it to South America, but I have two in particular that I think are the make the most sense. Before we get into those routes, I do want to say one of the first things you may think of is if they were so superior, which is the implication, why are they gone? My best guess is that if you look at people today, even in in the modern world of modern medicine, women die of childbirth. 1,000 years ago, 5, 10,000 years ago, far more common, okay? When you look at the babies of these things, mummified babies found in Paracas, they are real, of the same genetic lineage. They have extremely big skulls, and even teeth. Teeth that are the equivalent of a 12-year-old human today. And this was found in, I believe, an 8-month-old baby. Now, you have to imagine how hard it might be for a human to give birth to something like that. It must be incredibly difficult. Childbirth death might have been very common, in fact. It may have been very common for whatever these people were. It may have been incredibly difficult for them to proliferate quickly in a way that humans had less of an issue with. Humans breed fast. We love to have sex, right? It could have been the case that these things didn't have the same leeway in their ability to proliferate. And over time, they lost so many people from inbreeding with us and also being slaughtered by us that they were essentially bred out of the gene pool and evidence just kind of point us in that direction so i think what we could have seen is a group of very smart people who may have been the root for a lot of different civilization origin myths that escaped from their homeland in a last ditch effort against pastoralist steppe nomads, Hunnish type of individuals, who we know by the way at this time were migrating, were making waves all across Eurasia, okay? This is not a guess, and we know this. In fact, the Sea People, the myth of the Sea People happened at this precise moment as well. Interestingly enough, it is contemporary with these skulls and with a possible migration. And so it's almost something to wonder. You know, were the Sea Peoples in part influenced by these individuals or were they these individuals? We don't know. Now, again, back to the routes. Some people posit that one of the best possible routes could have been going from the Black Sea through the Straits of Constantinople, I'll just call them, through the Mediterranean, into the Nile Delta, through the Red Sea, following the coast, going past Madagascar perhaps, um, following the current by the Antarctica, and then making their way to Paracas, either through following the coastline or perhaps making a stop at uh, Easter Island, where there are giant statues of heads that look like these people with elongated skulls, some of which, by the locals' account, are given a red hat, which is actually supposed to symbolize red hair, okay? So it's very obvious that the Paracas people would have been here. And I'd like to see excavations of people in this area as well to see if we can find something like that. So there's, that's, there's that route, right? Now, another route, I actually like this route more because it explains why the Straits of Gibraltar are so well known by people from this general area, despite the fact that they have no reason to. And it also it explains the fascination with um, sea voyaging in this general area. And it could explain not only where these people got the knowledge of how 
to uh, create boats and to be on the seas, but also the technology in general to do it. And what this would imply is that they went through the Straits of Gibraltar and then they followed currents the same way Europeans did thousands of years later, and they ultimately could have ended up either in the Caribbean or just straight down to South America, which would imply why we have some maps from a time period in which nobody had supposedly been to South America from the old world, but that actually show this eastern coast of South America. And then from here, you have a variety of different routes. European explorers um, were able to take a river from this eastern part of South America and make it all the way out to the western part. Coincidentally, that could make it very easy for them to get from one side to the other and then find their way to Paracas. Could have been that they followed the currents and made it to Paracas from the south, or it could have been that they went uh, the Caribbean route and then they just trekked along the coast on land until they found where they wanted to be, or they hauled their boats over the land and then got back in them. I and mean, that's very normal too. You see it all the time. It's contemporary with the time for what we know of naval fighting. So it, it's interesting, right? Who are these people? Why do they have Caucasian blood? Why do they share a haplo group with Caucasian people? Why are they white with blonde hair and red hair, yet found in South America 2,800 years ago? Why are their skulls elongated and perhaps more so? Why is it not just a product of cranial deformation? Why does it look like this is something that genetically evolved to be different? And then why is it not here? On that note, I just want to bring up a very common myth that I'm sure all of us know, and that is of the Greek gods. And the Greek gods were said to have attempted to breed with humans because they believed that human women were beautiful. They were the most beautiful that they'd ever seen. And so they bred with us. You almost will have to wonder if these god myths are as a direct result of these elongated skulled individuals. And maybe that's why they're gone. Maybe they found these women, these human women, and all the stories are true of the raping and the capturing and the enslaving. And perhaps that's also why humans killed them all when they could. But maybe that's where the myth comes from. Maybe that's why they don't exist anymore. Perhaps. They would have rather bred with one of our women than one of their own, and then ultimately there weren't enough of them left, and then the ones that were left were killed very quickly in these mass graves that we find in places like Paracas. Maybe. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments section below. I find this very fascinating, and it's all conjecture, but we do have some actual hard evidence and facts now, like the genetics of these people being from this area. At all other points, I'm just guessing. But I think it's interesting, and I want to hear what you guys have to say. So leave a comment in the comment section below. Look up Brian Forster, please. Go watch all of his stuff, um, because it's absolutely fascinating. And I would have never believed it if it wasn't for the DNA that was found. That is what changed everything for me. So maybe it'll change everything for you too.